It's good to start off in worship together this morning. It's my privilege to be able to welcome to the stage now um, Dr. Rowan Williams, who uh, comes to speak to us about um, climate change. He comes to speak to us about issues of justice and righteousness. He comes to challenge us uh, regarding the question that we've placed ourselves before us today, um, a matter of faith. Climate change, is it a matter of faith for those of us within the Christian community? Dr. Williams comes to us as uh, an eminent theologian. He comes to us as the author of many, many books, um, Faith in the Public Square, um, The Lion's World, and many, many more significant uh, works that many of you perhaps have had the privilege of being able to read. Would you like to agree with me now as he comes to the stage, Dr. Rowan Williams? Just, just to say that um, uh, Dr. Williams is going to speak to us for about half an hour, and then um, there will be an opportunity afterwards uh, for some questions. Okay. Well, thank you very much indeed, Ian. Good morning, everybody. It's a, a great privilege to be here and to be able to take part in this very significant event. Significant because it happens just as Bristol, as a city, is committing itself to being a green capital at a time when globally we're renegotiating sustainable goals, a time when we're looking forward to the Paris Conference on Climate later in the year, when in fact we do stand at something of a moment of decision. And what I want to do briefly this morning is to say something about those words globally aware, something about how this impacts on faith, and something indeed, as we've heard about justice here. So let's start, perhaps, with the second rather than the first of those, and talk about this as a matter of faith. Our response to the crisis of climate change is sometimes thought to be a little bit of an add-on to our commitment to God and to Christ. And for some people, it's really rather low down on the list of priorities. It's a very high priority in Christian aid, which I chair, and sometimes we're challenged. Why is this so high up on our list of policy priorities? Now, there are some practical answers, but I think there is also an answer in terms of faith, and thus in terms of awareness. And essentially, it's to do with what we think we are, who we think we are as human beings in creation. Because our faith in God is not just a faith that God is the kind of God God shows himself to be. Our faith is also a matter of believing that we as human beings are the sort of human beings God sees us to be. Our faith is always an act of affirmation in God's vision of humanity as well as our vision of God. Because to be a person of faith is to be a person committed to live as if God's view of us were real and true. That's part of faith. Live as if God's vision of us were real and true. But of course, that implies living as if God's vision of the whole creation were what was most real and true. Christian belief assumes that because God is creator, what God sees and knows and loves in creation is what matters. And that's where we go right back to the beginning, to Genesis chapter 1. And what does God say about creation? He says it's good. Indeed, very good. And that, of course, means that if we are to live as people of faith, to live as if God's vision of creation were the one that mattered, we live in and out of that affirmation at the beginning of scripture. God sees what there is, and in his eyes it is good. So our faith involves working out what it means to live as if the world around us were good. And that doesn't mean some kind of sentimental assumption that all you need in order to believe in God is admiring sunsets. 
or reading slightly soppy poetry, you know, the kind you have on those cards with flowers on them. It's much more um, sharp and sometimes uncomfortable than that because we have drifted so very far in our vision of ourselves and our world from what God sees. We know that we have made ourselves not good in our relation to one another and to the world. And part of that is not treating the world around us as good for anything except for us. Faith always involves a very important moment of letting go. Letting go of our desperate anxiety to stuff the world inside ourselves, to treat the world as if it were there for our convenience, to trivialize and demean and enslave the world as we do so much with other human beings. And faith is letting go. The clenched hand turns into the open hand. That's, if you like, the, the great sign of faith. The hand which is balled up as if it were a fist opens up to the hand open to receive or to pray. That's the transition, that's faith. And the Christian response to climate change is a matter of faith in the sense that it's a matter, it's part of that letting go, unclenching. So much of the evil that's been inflicted on our material environment has been the result of the grasping, pulling of the world into ourselves, the clenched fist to defend ourselves against the world. And now we have to open. A matter of faith, seeing ourselves, seeing the world as God sees. And of course that takes us to awareness, doesn't it? What's the awareness we're trying to grow into? Something remotely like God's awareness. God's generous awareness, God's loving awareness, God's delighted awareness. God looks at the world and sees it good, and according to Proverbs, he's really happy about it. God loves the fact that the world is there. And part of what God asks of us is that we love the world because it's there. And all of that means and there are several passages in scripture we might talk about here, but I'll pick up just one or two of them. That means that our attitude to the world around us, just like our attitude to other persons, must never be one of possession. We don't own. We are given, but we don't own. So for example, if you look at what's said in Leviticus, in the famous chapter 25 about the Jubilee, you'll see that there's a prohibition on the absolute sale of land. You don't sell each other land forever because the land isn't yours. God says, as a matter of fact, the earth is mine. The earth is the Lord's and all that fills it, as we heard earlier. The earth is mine. What you're selling, says Leviticus, when you exchange contracts about land, you're selling a certain period of use. You're selling a series of harvests. You're selling part of the process of sustaining people and keeping community alive. But you're not owning something which you transfer to somebody else's ownership. God has lent the land to us, the earth, so that we may feed each other. Not as something which we simply seize and squeeze dry. The awareness that we're to grow into, the global awareness, is crucially that awareness of living in a world we don't own and don't control. And if you like, the great opposition in the spiritual life is between an attitude of possessiveness, grasping, and delight and contemplation on the other hand. The more we can get towards the delight and contemplation, the better. The more we're growing into God's delight in the world. The more we slip towards grasping, squeezing ownership, the further away we move from a faithful lifestyle and a lifestyle in which we are growing towards God.
So those are a few of the basics I would want to play in to this discussion about climate change as a matter of faith. Our response to the crisis of climate change, to the needs of those most at risk in our world from a changing climate, our response, if it's to be a response of faith, needs to be a response informed by all of that sense of letting go, of stepping back from ownership and control, learning to look at the environment with something of God's eyes. Because if the majority of scientists are right, part of the problem that's part of the process that's brought us here is generations of possessiveness, grasping, and therefore unfaith, looking at ourselves and our world with eyes other than God's. And while there are still those who want to debate exactly how far climate change is the result of human activity, it seems to me, frankly, idle to doubt that our approach to the environment makes it worse. Whatever might otherwise be going on, there can be no doubt, surely, that our constant, greedy, draining away of the world's resources makes things worse. And so we come to the question, which I was touching on a bit earlier this morning with the church leaders meeting, of why this is a matter of justice. Justice, in biblical terms, always a matter of right relationship. Being rightly attuned to the environment we're in. Picking up the signals, tuning in to what's around. That's justice. It's, the word is about being rightly fixed, rightly oriented. And so when we talk about a just relation to other human beings, to the creation, and to God, that imagery of alignment and attunement is always there in the background. It's far more than just the abstract distributive justice we sometimes think of. It's a real life-giving, life-sustaining relationship. And our response to the crisis of climate change is very much about how we rightly relate to the environment we're in. As I've said earlier this morning, rightly relate to what God sees, how God sees the world, but very much about how we rightly relate to our present and our future human neighbors. A matter of justice and right relation, because as we know, those who bear the heaviest burden in relation to climate change are those least well equipped for it, those who are poorest and most vulnerable in our world, whose lives and livelihood are undermined, largely because of decisions taken elsewhere and lifestyles adopted elsewhere. We cannot claim to be just, to be righteous, to be in right relationship with God or anything else if we just stand back and settle into complacency about the fact that those most at risk carry the heaviest burden. Those least well equipped carry most responsibility in our eyes. You'll hear more today about what that actually looks and feels like. But for me, it's expressed most vividly in a photograph that I was shown about three years ago by a friend from the Pacific. It's a photograph taken from a distance of one of the Pacific islands. You could just see on the coastline a village, and about halfway up the hill behind it, another settlement looking slightly newer. And my friend said, they're like that, quite simply, because the village at sea level has become uninhabitable. Everybody's having to move further up, build new settlements. And that, of course, doesn't just mean moving house in a nice, comfortable way with Pickfords to help you. It means starting a new livelihood, often in circumstances with materials and resources that are not what you expected. It means communities left feeling very vulnerable. 
It means a lot of trauma, a lot of upheaval, and probably in the, the process of that, a lot of sheer human unhappiness. That's bad. It's not the worst, though. And you'll hear more today about the far more serious situations that are increasingly arising in many parts of the world, such as Bangladesh. So justice, right relation to people in those circumstances requires at least two things. First of all, the very simple and practical question, what do we do to build the capacity to survive a crisis like that? What do we do to help people build the capacity to survive that sort of crisis? That's where, for Christian Aid, this is such an enormous priority. And the work we found ourselves doing in South Asia, in Latin America, and in rather different environments in East Africa, has a great deal to do with that simple question, how do we build the capacity to live through such trauma? Because that is a matter of justice. It's a matter of right relation. It's a matter of helping people discover better ways of relating to their environment on the spot. It's a matter, more importantly, of our discovering better ways of living with them, living in a way of responsibility towards them. And it entails that bigger question, the challenge to our lifestyle. If even in some relatively minor way, the way we live is contributing to the vulnerability, to the risk of somebody elsewhere in our world, we are challenged to challenge that. On your seats, you'll see the carbon fast proposals which, in a wonderfully well-focused way, show you some of the things you can do simply to signal awareness, again, global awareness, of how, without noticing it, we may be contributing, we are very likely to be contributing to the risk of other human beings. So that's about justice. As the Old Testament repeatedly reminds us, it's no good having a fast that has nothing to do with justice. Fasting is always about restoring right relation with God and others. And then there's the question, which I suppose has been coming to the fore rather more strongly in the last few years. This quite odd notion of being just to generations yet to come. Climate justice is about our children and our grandchildren. And of course, it's about the children and the grandchildren of lots of people we don't know as well. It's not just our own family, our own progeny. This is about right relationship with those who are yet to be born. Because in the grand mystery of God's economy, we are related to all sorts of people we don't know and will never meet, not only the dead, and the living, but those yet to come. And if we're to be in right relationship with those who've gone before us, and right relationship with those who share the globe with us now, surely we also need to be in right relationship with those who will come after us. And leaving those who come after us with a wrecked world, just as much as leaving them with a wrecked economy, is a profoundly unjust thing to be doing. It is wrong relation with those to come. A matter of faith and a matter of justice, therefore. A matter of faith because the letting go that I've said is part of the life of faith is also an opening of the hand to the other. It's a matter of restoring relatedness. That's justice. There's another sense, of course, in which we might talk about all of this as a matter of faith. Because the obvious question that comes back and frequently comes back when I've talked about this in the past is, yeah, but is it going to work? Is it not too late? Is not the problem too big? Shouldn't we just really put a paper bag over our heads? Those of you who've ever seen The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy will remember the allusion there. 
can we make a difference? And that's where I think faith comes in yet again. Because one of the odd things about faith is that because it has to do with living our way into right relation, the rightness, the life-giving quality that we're talking about is not all about success. It's not all about whether it works or not. It's about whether it's right. It's about whether it gives life today. And we hope and pray that it'll give life for tomorrow. But life for today is always a possibility. We can always change today. We can change in small ways our relation with one another and with our world. Here in the carbon fast are some suggestions, and there are many more things that people will talk about today that will make that small difference. And to repeat something I've said so often, I'm tired of hearing myself say it, the issue is not can I make all the difference, it is what's the difference I can make. Not can I make all the difference, but what's the difference I can make. Because today, there is always a difference I can make. And that's a matter of faith, a matter of trust. Trust that this is worthwhile, that this is truthful, this is life-giving today. For me, for everybody I come in contact with. To change, to grow into another way of living, another lifestyle, is also something which brings faith alive in others. If I can say to those on the other side of the world who suffer partly because of my and our complacency, if I can say to them, I'm seeking to live differently because of you, then that is one reason they have for trust and for hope. Not only about faith for me, but faith and trust for another as well. Helping people out of the despairing sense, which is so vivid in many communities, the despairing sense that nobody out there cares. Back to my friend from the Pacific, showing these slides at a conference and saying, well, you need to see these, but I don't know how much difference they'll make. And sometimes when you hear the stories of those in the Pacific or Bangladesh or wherever else, you hear the stories of those at the raw end of this question and the lack of response from so much of our leadership as well as ourselves, I think they have Moses and the prophets. They will not listen even if one goes to them from the dead. How much does it take to create awareness? But at least when we respond in some ways by some transformation of our lifestyle, we are giving some other people the ground for trust in a future. At the very least, ground for the trust that they're not forgotten, that there are those willing to stand alongside them, to recognize their crisis, their danger, and to work with them. So climate change is a matter of faith in two senses. A matter that's bound up with many, many deep fundamental aspects of our Christian believing and acting. A matter of fundamental attitudes which reflect or fail to reflect basic faith. A trust in the creator, a trust in God's point of view on creation. The attempt to live into that and to unclench our fists as we live our way into that. The recognition that our relationship to the world around us is not one of ownership. We are joyful guests in a world whose resources are lent to us so that we can make them work for the whole human community. Back to Leviticus, what you are selling is a series of harvests. Not a thing called the soil, but a process of feeding and nourishing for a period of years, all of that bound up with fundamental faith so that our attitude to our environment is indeed not an add-on. It is absolutely built in to learning to live as a faithful creature, part of God's world. But then also a matter of faith because in our response to this we express or we fail to express our trust in the rightness of God's way of relating to the world. 
And in our response to these crises, we give or we fail to give to others a ground for trust and hope in the world. When a whole civic community like the city of Bristol decides that it's going to be a center, a benchmark for responsible approaches to the environment, my heart lifts, I must say, and I'm sure yours does as well. Because what we're up against is the need to change a whole culture around, a culture which is so often unaware. As in quite a lot of areas of our global life at the moment, we seem so often to be stumbling blindly towards a precipice, as if we barely know just how bad it could get. So that when a community, a whole civic community, becomes aware in that sense, there's a great deal to be grateful for. But let's be under no illusion about this. Changing cultures is hard work. And what changes cultures in the long run is groups of people who are so passionately committed to another culture, another style of relating and living, that they will sooner or later change the assumptions of the context they live in. It takes time. It took centuries to change people's assumptions about slavery, inside and outside the church. But because our communications are quicker, and perhaps our sense of urgency is a little bit more focused in this one, I don't think it, it need take centuries to change the culture in respect of our environmental responsibility. But for that to happen, we need the passionate commitment of the believing community, the community of faith, to serve, to stimulate, to encourage the society around us. Society needs people, let's put it bluntly, society needs people like us. Who, me, we say, blushing modestly? No, no, society really does need people like us who have solid, good reason for looking at the world in a certain way because they, they believe that's how God sees it. And that's a pretty robust reason for action and lifestyle, frankly. But without that robust rootedness of vision, things won't change. That's why it is so important for our churches to be crystal clear about this as a priority and to be modeling different ways of behaving, different ways of relating, to be modeling justice and right relation. So my hope and prayer for today and the months ahead is that certainly in this city, in this region, communities of faith will be a crucial part of the ongoing motivation for change repeatedly asking that question, not how can I make all the difference, but what's the difference I can make, and repeatedly coming back to that central insight that it's all about the clenched fist to the open palm. It's all about the movement from aggression to receiving and relating. A matter of faith. We pray earnestly and hope passionately that the action we take, and please God, the action that governments will take in the light of the summit later in the year, will make the difference that's needed for the poorest communities in the world. We want that desperately to happen. But meanwhile, never mind the calculations about how difficult it's going to be. This is the right thing today. This is justice here and now. These are the restored and healed relationships we can help to happen now. These are the ways in which we give other people grounds for faith and hope, for trust now. So, a good time to start is now. And I hope that from today, some of that energy and inspiration which we ought to be feeling around this issue will grow very, very rapidly very earnestly 
joyfully and hopefully. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Um, Jesus is no doubt our greatest model of what it means to be a person of justice. Um, he said this, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed people go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Um, as Archbishop of Canterbury, you had uh, the privilege of traveling around the world and seeing uh, the church uh, involved in uh, issues of social justice, in issues of envir environmental justice. You saw um, righteousness in action. If, if you could identify one particular uh, model used by a church that, that sort of um, brings together a, a response to environmentalism, effective one. And bearing in mind that most churches around the world don't have the money to do stuff, do they? Uh, many of us worship in, in, in churches, perhaps similar to this, where we have the advantages of technology, we have resources, we have finance. Many churches don't have that. And here in the UK, there are many churches, struggling churches, that don't have the finance to be able to um, tackle some of these issues. What's the, what's the one thing that they could do that you, you perceive? Thank you, yes. Um, flying around the world, stocking up my carbon footprint while uh, finding out about environmental issues, yes. Um, it's a real irony, that, isn't it, for many of those involved in this, and I feel it rather acutely, but I can think of a number of a number of contexts where I've seen extraordinary things being done there. I suppose the one that made most impact, and I'll come back to the local question in a minute, was visiting some communities in Kenya, where there's a major problem about deforestation and the desertification of some agricultural land. The Anglican Church in Kenya, which has one of the most effective social ministries of any of the African Anglican churches, had been encouraging um, a sort of biogas project in the villages, whereby um, cow dung was recycled for fuel through a simple gas processing mechanism so that you could actually cook for a village with the daily produce of three cows. I, I watched this process from, uh, <clears throat> from cow to kitchen. Cows over there, tank underneath, simple processing, piped to um, kitchens around the village, and therefore no need to go and cut down wood for fuel, but an opportunity to plant trees which were assured for a short future. Now that, that seemed to me a wonderfully elegant and sustainable kind of response to what in Kenya is a really very challenging situation where you have not only the deforestation issue because of fuel questions, not only the degradation of the soil, but you've also got um, the, the plain change in climate, that the seasons don't come when you expect them, that you don't know when to start planting for the harvest. Which relates to another project, which Christian Aid's been very much involved in there and elsewhere, which is developing um, an app for farmers, which will allow them on the mobile phones that everybody has in, in Africa, to find out what the right time is to start planting. So farmers can, rather than just taking potluck on a very, very unpredictable uh, climate situation, they can actually have some um, proper information. So these, these are quite small scale things, but when you think about it, you're creating more and more communities that are better at sustaining themselves. So just briefly on what happens here, where it's probably not entirely realistic to have cows providing uh, fuel for cooking. Uh, there's, a, there's a challenge for Bristol. How many cows to, how many cows to cook for Bristol, eh? <laughs> um, but 
those are illustrations of you know, the small difference. And where a church, a congregation, doesn't have the financial resources for, let's say, a major rebuild of their premises, the lifestyle question is still important for every individual. What are the ways in which I can simply signal for myself, reminding myself every day, that my use of water, let's say, my preferred means of transport, that these are impacting on the environment, what can I do? I, everyone has that capacity of discerning and choosing, let's say. Yes. And we take that example from Jesus, rolled up the scroll today. Dead. Today, yes. Yes. Uh, we're going to go to questions in a minute, but just to say um, that today has actually been videoed and it will be available online. A number of people were asking before we started, what, was it going to be recorded? It is being videoed and it will be available online and we'll give you the address of that a little later on. So we're going to go to questions. Um, have we got a roving mic that we can use, sir? Do you want to take one of these? Okay. Okay, so we've got time for uh, a number of questions this morning. Uh, yes, a gentleman in the middle with his hand. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Williams, for an excellent uh, talk. Uh, my question is going to be related to this country, but I am very much involved in overseas, having had a career in agriculture, and I'm heading out to Kenya tomorrow morning. Wonderful. Um, my point is about urbanization and the way people lose contact with the land. Um, here in Bristol, we have a community farm, and I make an appeal to everyone here. They're having, it's located in a beautiful bit of country near the Chew Lake, which is the water supply, one of the water supplies for Bristol. And they're having some financial problems right now. So if you'd like to go on to Bristol Community Farm and see if you can give them support, it would be much appreciated. They take out young people from the city who got into problems over drugs and alcohol, and they give them some training in horticulture. Yes, my main question is, do you think that urbanization makes a disconnect between people and the land? Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I'm very glad you mentioned the, the therapeutic work that a farm like that can do, because I, I happen to be patron of a little charity in Wales, which does exactly the same thing, a small holding where young people with a, a record of crime or drugs can go and find a new way of relating, once again. But there's no doubt about it, urbanization does have that effect. And I guess that because people still have some deep sense of hunger to relate to the natural world, that's where gardens and allotments and all these things, and you know, growing vegetables in your garden, all, all these things which can still be done in quite a few urban settings, are a significant part of a response to this. Because even though it may not be at all obvious why a garden or an allotment might contribute to a better world, capital B, capital W, the fact is that it's about awareness once again. It's, it's quite easy, it's dangerously easy sometimes in an urban environment to forget what you depend on. That you actually depend for food on something other than supermarkets that milk doesn't come from supermarkets, but from cows, that peas don't come from shops, but from plants. <laughs> and it's that sense of a kind of buffer between us and the natural world, a sense that our real dependence on the environment, that, that's weakened in the urban setting. We do need to push back at that. And I welcome all those initiatives which try to reconnect people there. It's not as if you, know, you can reverse the process of urbanization. It happened for all sorts of reasons. Some of them are good, some of them bad. And you know, there's not going to be a rush back to the soil um, in the next six months. But what we can do is, again, if we're interested in awareness, simply reawaken our sense of connectedness and dependence with the world we're in. Back to Leviticus. You know, God has given us the use of the land, not as a possession, but as something we use in order to nourish a community. And that's what we have to keep in focus, I think. Uh, 
Hi there. Yeah, um, I'm, a, I'm a climate scientist, and uh, we quite often discuss amongst ourselves um, the problem of communication with the general public. And one thing that, uh, that we observe is that the um, nature of the, the message that quite often comes across is very uh, religious in tone. I'm talking about sort of very old-fashioned sort of hellfire and brimstone. So sort of repent of your fornication with fossil fuels or you will burn in the hell of future global warming. Uh, you know, and people are divided into believers and non-believers. Uh, and this falls on quite deaf ears amongst a lot of the general public. You know, it's not a message that's well received in the modern world. You know, it might have worked on Victorians. But. Mm. And uh, as a church, as, as church communities, we've probably learned quite a lot about communicating uh, a message, you know, in more, and in relating, as you say, in a better way. And you've talked in, in quite a lot about that already, actually. I suppose my question is, you know, how can we, as a church community, bring that learning to the, to the wider scientific community? Thank you. That, that's a very interesting perception, I think, about um, the religious tone of the talk about climate change. And, of course, if the message that's coming through is simply we're all doomed, um, then motivation can be a little bit weak in response to that. Or, you know, what do you mean this is no time to panic? This is the perfect time to panic. Um, th that doesn't help. That's where I come back again and again to this sense of the valuation, the faithful valuation of small things, small differences. Um, and as, as Christian, well, at least uh, certain kinds of Christian, like myself, who have a very strong belief in the sacramental in the world, you know, the small thing can signify the big thing. The life and energy of God's work can be signified helpfully and transformingly in changing something, something small. A bit of bread and a sip of wine in Holy Communion signify the massive change in the whole world's destiny brought about in the events of, of Christ's death and resurrection. You know, we, we know something about sacramentality. I wouldn't put it like that for the general audience, but what I'm saying is simply that we do understand something of the value of small things. And I hope that that can be one of, one of the ways in which we make this not just a we're all doomed message. This, uh... Thank you very much for a marvelous start to Bristol's European Green Capital Year. But fundamental question, is it too difficult to do what we know we have to do? We've got to reduce our energy consumption. We've got to change our transport patterns, drive slower. Are we really man-made climate change deniers? And therefore, are we actually denying God? I like that way of putting it, um, that we are effective climate change deniers in the way we, we behave. And we are a lot of the time. I am a lot of the time. I guess a lot of people in this, this hall are. Um, which is why we need, again and again, to dust off these fundamentals. So what can I do? Help one another, encourage one another. Um, churches that make shared commitments on this help by setting a benchmark for people. And yeah, maybe it's too big. Maybe it really is. But we as believers have no business to say that. We have to say, well, we trust that this is how to be in our world. We are trying to find a healthier way of being in our world. Please, God, it'll change things. But even if it doesn't, it's still a healthier way to be in the world. And that's worth it. It's profoundly worth it. So, yeah, there does need to be some quite difficult um, prioritizing. Do we start with turning the taps off or um, putting our foot on the brake? I guess for different people, there'll be different priorities. But to have something, again, like this um, carbon fast, it's just to 
check off. These, these are the things we all can relate to, we all can do something about. And um, hmm, not to be overwhelmed by it. Faith, once again, faith. There's somebody back there who has been trying to get in, I think, the gentleman in the brown jacket. Um, I'm Bernard Omar. I, I wondered if you could broaden the uh, answer. Uh, the, uh, Bristol has a sig significant number of communities of other world faiths, uh, hardly represented yes. here today, apart from the Christian uh, people um, of other countries. Um, to what extent can Christian aid work with those other communities for the greater good? Thank you very much indeed for that. Um, I think the answer is that that is very much on our radar and in our priorities. I remember um, some years ago, just before the Copenhagen summit, the rather ill-fated Copenhagen summit, we convened a meeting of young Christians and young Muslims at Lambeth Palace to talk together about the climate issue. And together, these 25, 30 young people put together a, a charter, a sort of agreed set of visions and principles that they as Christians and Muslims could sign up to together and asked me to take it to Copenhagen on their behalf. So I think there really is synergy possible between people of different faiths and backgrounds on this and it needs exploring and it needs, it needs drawing out. Most of the great faiths do have um, you know, a serious commitment to the sacredness of the world in some way and just drawing that out and making sure we make the connections in those different environments, yes, I, I want to see more of that. As it is, of course, Christian Aid does work with quite a number of communities that are, that are not majority Christian and increasingly works alongside Islamic relief in some contexts. So we would expect to be going on, keeping that dialogue alive. I'm grateful you mentioned that. Uh, Dr. Williams, uh, thank you. My question is about um, right relation across continents. There's talk of interdependence, but actually in, uh, in my thinking, if I don't think of, I don't know, where my coffee or bananas come from, then my effect on other people is much greater than their effect on me. And how do we, um, how can we relate? Thank you. Mm, that's, yes, that's difficult. Um, and that's where I think we need to keep quite a broad perspective in our minds in terms of time as well as space. At any given moment in um, our present setting, as you say, the impact of my behavior on them may look like more than their impact on me. But in the long run, this is one world we inhabit. And the poverty and the chaos of another society doesn't just sit comfortably on the other side of the world. It's going to impact on me sooner or later, one way or another, in the long term. And I think we just need to have that always in our minds as part of, part of the framework. It's not just an endless asymmetry. And of course, we just begin to see the effects of both um, environmental degradation and crisis and strife and civil conflict in developing economies with larger and larger numbers of refugees and migrants and all the pressures that, that brings sort of domino effect across the world. We don't live in, you know, sealed capsules. And I was very struck to hear earlier this morning about the Bangladeshi situation and the way in which the movement of population away from a, a salinating lowland where you can't cultivate any longer up into highlands brings pressures between different ethnic groups. The same story could be told in Bolivia where again Christian Aid has had a project relating to this. So hmm, the, the basic Christian assumption that all our human destinies are ultimately bound together 
and we either serve one another or kill one another in a sense, that does, does show itself in practice in the longer term and we just need to keep that in, in focus, I think. I will understand if you don't want to answer this question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. I was in Manila in the summer, you and were. Manila in the Philippines, and have never seen poverty like I saw. And the English charity worker I was with, I said to her one day, Karen, how can this ever be changed? And this is where you may not want to answer it. She said, until the Pope says it's all right to have birth control, nothing in this country will change. I will understand if you don't want to answer it. <laughs> well, whether or not I want to, I probably ought to. <laughs> um, first of all, uh, because I'm not a Roman Catholic, I, I don't share the Pope's view about birth control. So, um, and I rather hope that that discipline changes. I have to be candid about that for many, many reasons. I'm ever so slightly cautious about the way in which some people think, oh, if we have population control, that's the magic bullet. Because I actually don't think it is. And sometimes, um, that, I've heard it used by you know, Westerners talking about the developing world as if, oh, well, if they didn't have so many children, there wouldn't be this problem. And I don't think that, that's not what you mean, not what your friend meant, I know. Um, because that's just, blaming the victim in another way. And as we all know, large families in stressed developing economies are one of, one of the means of economic security for some people. So I don't think it's uh, an absolute black and white question, but I do rather hope that things will change on that front because I think it would make a, a tangible difference and the fact of that little bit more um, freedom of decision, especially for women. You know, I'm, again, I'm not one of those who think that um, getting women's reproductive rights sorted will solve everything. But because women are such crucial agents of transformation in all these situations, the more freedom of decision, the more sense of responsible planning that is available for women as for men, the better things will get. Is someone with a question for over there? No? So, we'll go Hi, I really enjoyed your talk actually, lots of points in there, particularly the ones around justice. And it was interesting, I, I work for a transition network and um, we were at a meeting in Powys um, last year and we were talking about the impacts of climate change and we were talking about how people are being impacted already in this country through the austerity agenda, enabling, so people are already in this country are feeling the impacts of not being able to afford energy, to not be able to buy the food that they need, to buy the housing that they need. And it's as if like this, there's this environment, in the environmental problems as they increase will make resources more scarce. So we then enter a situation where who gets what resource? And I mean, I just would like to know how, how can you, how can we have a just world when resource allocation under, under capitalism is so un, unequal? I mean, the commons movement is one approach that I've looked at recently where things should be held in common. But I just mm. wondered what your views are on mm. that. Thank you. That's really, really important, I think, because that flags up a number of things. First of all, it reminds us that this is not just academic talk about people somewhere else. It really is impacting. Second, you reminded us that resource scarcity is one of the major sources of conflict. It's very visible in some bits of the world. It's becoming visible and will become more visible in this country as all these issues around austerity begin to bite. The price of austerity is not just discomfort, it's potentially real conflict, real you know, social instability. 
So I just want to un underline that very, very strongly, and thank you for raising it. Um, I, well, I'll put my cards on the table here and say I really hope that in the forthcoming election campaign, issues of inequality are named for what they, what they are and the damage that they do. We've had the research, the Wilkinson and Pickett book, The Spirit Level, which, again, gives you this Moses and the Prophets feeling. Well, you know, what more do you need to know? Inequality is bad at every level for us, bad for our psyches as well as for our bodies. And all of that ought to make us think that one of the biggest mistakes we can make, but it is a mistake which people make gleefully and shamelessly, one of the biggest mistakes we can make is to say, well, the environmental thing is doubtless very important, but we've got more important priorities to work on. We've got to get the economy sorted out before we sort out ecology. I can't remember who first said that the economy of any country is a wholly owned subsidiary of ecology. But we need to remember that if we're to get the right perspective on things and to, to see that if some of these issues are going to be resolved, there are some very serious macroeconomic questions that have to be tackled. I think we've got time for one more very, very quick question. Uh, yeah, we'll come over here because we haven't done this. Thank you. You've, you've touched on a couple of issues that are very dear to my heart. The first is um, uh, the issue of um, the value of land uh, mm -hmm. and issues around land value taxation um, are, are, very, are, are very current at the moment. I think the other issue that I think is very important is the monetary system, which you also touched on in your talk when you're talking about the Jubilee. Um, there are organisations like Positive Money, for example, that are campaigning very intelligently for fundamental changes to the banking system and to, and to monetary reform. I was very actively involved in Occupy in London on the steps of St Paul's and it was over since, since Occupy started there have been all sorts of fascinating initiatives around monetary reform. Um, do you think it's Christian to vote anything other than Green in the forthcoming election? <laughs> My goodness, there's a possibly comment. <laughs> but, um, the, uh, sorry? <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. Um, it's difficult to see where else some of this agenda is coming up. That's, that's my worry, and that's why I say I just long to see the campaign raising these issues. And my fear is that we will be distracted again and again in the forthcoming campaign from the questions that really matter. Which is why we need the Green Party in, you know, firmly in the mainstream of discussion about this and um, hoping that it just might shame one or two other parties which will be nameless into being a little bolder. <laughs> okay, thank you. I'm sure you'd like to express your appreciation to uh, Dr. Williams. <laughs>